I've, I can honestly say I've never met somebody so passionate about clays before and uh, <laughs> excited, excited to have her with us and, and giving this talk this morning. Um, Heather currently leads the COSIA Clay Focus Group and um, with that, I'd love to welcome her up here for giving us uh, a talk on demystifying the methylene blue index. Heather. Thanks. So yeah, this, this one is the one I'm um, extremely excited about. I've been coming to this conference since it started in 2008. I just graduated from my PhD at that point, and um, every conference I've come to, I have asked multiple questions about clay. Usually, so did you measure the clay content? And I often get the answer, well, no, because we didn't really know how, or, well, yes, but we didn't really understand it, so we didn't report it. And that has made me want to pull up my hair multiple times. So, in the interest of solving a problem, I decided that it was time to demystify the methylene blue index. So, I'll ignore the legal disclaimer, but what is the methylene blue index? The methylene blue index is really simple. It's a titration test result. That's it. So the titration is done where methylene blue is added to a sample to determine the surface active clay. And there's a whole lot of debate as to whether or not this measures cation exchange capacity or clay surface area or exactly what the test method measures and is organics. It, it really doesn't matter. It's an index test for our problems. Um, and so it's very useful as an index test. The test that is used in the industry is a modification of the ASTM standard. If you use the ASTM standard, it doesn't work as well, and I will explain why in a minute. Um, <clears throat> there are four key steps. The first is dispersion, and as uh, conveniently Ron Curry has just um, demonstrated, dispersion is not as easy as one thinks, um, particularly in our samples, particularly if they've been deemed starked. You really, 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 really need to focus on dispersion, and it is the number one issue with errors in measurement of clays. Um, acidification is the second step, and it eliminates the influence of your amorphous iron hydroxides, and it controls your pH effects. The next step is you do a stepwise addition of methylene blue. So you have your slurry, you're adding your methylene blue in there, and you're taking a small aliquot in a pipette out of that sample and doing a spot test on a filter paper. So you go, okay, let's take this out, uh, put a drop on our filter paper, and we're looking for a halo of methylene blue around the endpoint. And again, people, when they first see this, go, oh my goodness, this is so inaccurate, and it's so hard to determine the endpoint, and how can this possibly be a good index test? And then you realize that all the other tests for clays are even more inaccurate, and that this is actually a pretty good one. Um, and if you have the right calibrations and standards and training, it's quite repeatable and therefore very useful. Um, and finally, you calculate your index properties. So a couple of key differences between the ASTM method and the clay focus slash CANMET method. So uh, when I'm saying the clay focus method here, this is from the Conrad days. We had a clay focus draft method, and that's the one that's published in the paper. Uh, we never did finalize this method, and the COSIA clay focus group is going to be looking at this again. Actually, our next meeting is on Friday, and we'll be looking at it there. Um, and there may be some testing and things like that that we need to do to validate that. But that's, so it's an unvalidated method, but it's kind of the method that's used. So the ASDM method specifies a concentration of 0 0.01 normal. The AS, or the CANMET slash clay focus group method um, specifies a concentration of 0 .06, 0 0.006 normal. This is important because the lower concentration improves the sensitivity of your results gives you a much more sensitive endpoint, and it reduces the formation of dimers. So rather than having two molecules of methylene blue compete for one space on the surface, you generally get only one molecule of methylene blue competing for a space on the surface, and so you can get a more accurate representation of sort of this active surface area. Um, the next two points are about the dispersion. So the methylene blue index test doesn't actually um, in the ASTM method, doesn't actually give you any indications about how to disperse this stuff. It just says, mix it until it's uniformly dispersed. 
which is exactly useless. Um, so it's good if you know about clays and you can recognize clay dispersion and you are familiar with dealing with clays and know exactly kind of how much mixing you're going to need to do. Um, for our samples, they're really hard to disperse, again, as Ron has pointed out. And so we use a bi sodium bicarbonate and hy sodium hydroxide buffer to help disperse that um, the clays, it's the, the chemistry component. And then there's a whole lot of mixing, so mixing and sonication. And the mixing times and sonication times that are in these procedures are actually just guidelines. Um, the actual dispersion is a visual identification. Um, there is a YouTube video that I link in my paper, and I didn't do it here because I always know that it's problematic to link videos and I didn't want to hassle. Um, but you can see what it looks like when you have that streaming birefringence of your clay and have actually achieved dispersion. The other two points are more minor, so the sample mass. Um, we allow for a larger sample mass in the, the oil sands methods um, because that allows us to have more sensitive uh, determination of sandier materials. And then the filter paper is different because it's been found that we get a clearer halo and easier to determine endpoint with the Wattman 42 versus the Baroid 98. So once again, I will harp on the importance of dispersion. Um, in case you haven't noticed, that is the theme of my talk, dispersion, dispersion, dispersion. Um, it's important to expose these clay surfaces. Undispersed clay stacks have an interface layer spacing of about half a nanometer, whereas methylene blue would require about 1.3 nanometers to access these surfaces. Um, you have to look at um, this graph, which was published in the Conrad Clay Workshop in 2011, um, and it really shows the uh, importance of that, that dispersion time. Uh, if you do not give enough time for your dispersion or enough energy input into your sample, you can get a methylene blue index test that will be somewhere between a non-dispersed and a dispersed test, and you don't know where it is, so it's, it's highly unrepeatable. If you are in the dispersed zone, you'll get a nice flat response and a very repeatable test can be achieved. So before testing a new sample, so again, the guidelines in the, in the method were developed for MFT that had been de deemed starked. If you're dealing with even more difficult to disperse samples, such as froth treatment tailings, you probably need to do these tests to confirm that you have sufficient dispersion. These are the calculations. I put them up here solely for reference. They are in the paper, and you will also be able to see these slides after. Um, one thing that's really important to recognize is the uncertainty in your measurements. So typical titration is one milliliter increments. That means that your endpoint is only known to plus or minus one milliliter. So you have at least that amount of uncertainty in your results. This is why it's really important to ask the labs to actually provide you with what the milliliters they actually titrated was. What was the end point? How much mass was in their sample? So you can calculate what your uncertainty is. If your mils to of titrated methylene blue is above 10, then you're looking at a 10% error due to uncertainty or less. And that's assuming you have well calibrated, you know, you've done all those standard calibrations and you have well trained operators. If your endpoint is less than 10 milliliters, it is not a valid test because you are going to have too much uncertainty in that endpoint. So I have seen people try and pass off endpoints of 2 milliliters as valid, and they're not. So don't do that, please. Um, and please report what your actual uncertainty is when you're reporting your measurements. So the recommendation from our group and from all of our discussions has been you're looking for endpoints between 10 milliliters and 50 milliliters. If it's more than 50 milliliters, there's a lot of questions as to whether or not all of those little aliquots that you took out of your sample has now shifted the mass of your sample so much that you may be affecting your endpoint. So we recommend redoing the test at that point. Another issue with methylene blue is the challenges in communicating the results. So you will notice in the limited publications that are out there, there are about four different methods of reporting methylene blue results. There is the methylene blue index, which gives you a milli equivalent per 100 gram as an actual SI unit. And then there's the milliliters of methylene blue per 100 gram of material, which is assuming that you have a normality of 0.06 normal. 
And that's usually in the range of 2,000 or, you know, between 100 and 2,000, depending on if you're an or or a, or a slurry. Um, or there's the method of reporting methylene blue weight, which is reporting a gram or a mass of methylene blue per gram of sample. So you get numbers in like that 38 range. Or there's the conversion to percent clay, uh, developed by Amar Sethi, and then you get a percentage clay. Uh, units are often not used in some of these reporting. They just tell you it was a methylene blue index test, and they don't give you the units. Units are important. Um, and you also, if you're reporting in mils per 100 gram, they don't specify the normality. So it's important to do that if you're going to use methylene blue number. Um, and it's really important to include that repeatability or that uncertainty in your, in your data. Another common misconception, clay content by methylene blue can in fact be greater than 100% and will be in fact for those upper layers of MFT. If you're seeing numbers that are greater than 100%, that just means that you have an enriched proportion of swelling type clays. So to put this in perspective, if you had a pure bentonite sample, you would expect to get a percentage clay by our methylene blue index testing using the amr Sethi correlation of about 730%. So greater than 100%, not a big deal. It's a useful number. Use it, love it, learn it. Do not try and normalize it. That would be wrong. Um, so another common misconception, correlations with particle size distributions. You're measuring a fundamentally different thing. So sometimes, and in fact often, you will not necessarily have a good correlation to your particle size measurements. That's okay. Um, again, it means you have more or less different kinds of active clays. And I will go into this um, in a little bit de more detail here, which is if you had, let's say, a pure sample of kaolinite, so everybody agrees, kaolinite is a clay mineral. You could, in fact, maybe, uh, so kaolinite often has particle size distributions. Um, you'll start seeing it below about 10 microns. So in around 10 microns is where kaolinite will usually show up. But a large proportion will be less than two microns. The surface area is usually around 20 meters squared per gram. So if you had a pure surface uh, methylene blue test of that sample, you would expect to get an MBI of around three, which is an expected percent clay using the Sethi correlation of about 19%. But you may measure a particle size less than two microns of 80%. Again, different methods, different measurement techniques understands what your measurement method is actually measuring. Which is also important when you're com comparing hydrometer and particle size by laser. They're measuring fundamentally different things and they will give you different results. They're all useful. Understand what it is that you're trying to measure when you're measuring that clay size so you can interpret it properly. So recommendations for methylene blue use. Use your methylene blue as um, MBI, which is your milli equivalent per 100 gram, because you don't require any additional information in your reporting. You can just put your units and people can use that data. If you use methylene blue number, then you have to report the normality and all sorts of other things. So report your methylene blue with an uncertainty range based on the actual test results. Um, was it 10% accurate? Was it, was it better? Uh, use a standard test to uh, for solution concentration and operator reliability, uh, reliability and confirm your dispersion. Repeat the test with a longer dispersion time if you're getting things that look a little odd. Check your reasonableness of your data. Confirm your milliliters of endpoints end are between 10 and 50. Confirm the consistency of your standard titration and do perform quality control tests. So very quickly, I will show one use of this test that is relevant to this committee. So Omotoso and Melanson presented this at PACE, um, and it really shows that you can use your methylene blue index, um, or your percent solids by methylene blue, to predict your volume of MFT that you're gonna get. Your fines content will break down because after 100% fines, you're not getting any resolution. But as you get to higher percentages of clay by methylene blue, you're, you're still gonna see that linear um, correspondence um, 
uh, in your volume. So more clay means more, more fluid fine tailings. That's kind of what you need to know. So I will leave it there and uh, ask for questions because I'm hoping this sparks some interest. Oh, and um, one more thing, shameless plug for the clay conference, cosia.ca slash clay. Be there if you want to know more, because there's so much more. <laughs> <laughs>